Au e awai rea te one tapu, kā hura tangatauta te tūra ki atu ki tangata atai, kā hura tangata atai te tūra ki atu ki tangata auta. Pērā hoki rā te kohore pe nui, te kohore pe roa, te wāhi awa, te toe toe awa, whakamau wā, tamaki te ara, whakamoe, tamaki te ara, no tū no rongo, whano, whano, haramai te toki, haumie, huie, tai ki e. A e te marea, na rau mai, nau mai, tau mai, ki tēnei o ngā poho, a o te kupu kōrero, o te kupu rangahau, Nau mai, haere mai. E mihi ana ki te whenua, e tangi ana ki te tangata. Koutou a te kāhui wairua, ko hiake i roto i ngā marama e ngā tau, ki te waka o tamarereti, taramainuku, haere whetsurangitia koutou. Koutou ki a koutou, tātou ki a tātou, te hunga ora, ngā mana ngai, hi ngā wehi, ngā tapu ngā whakamatakutanga katoa. Nau mai, haere mai, whakatau mai. Uh, welcome everyone, my name is Kawiti Waitford and it is a pleasure to have you join us today for this webinar, Help Me Sleep. Uh, today's webinar is hosted by A Better Start National Science Challenge and the Fano Afina Plunkett. A Better Start National Science Challenge is a collaborative research program working to help children, teenagers and their Fano achieve the best possible start in life. Its mission is to find practical, evidence-based solutions that make a measurable difference for tamariki, improving the potential for all young New Zealanders to have a healthy weight, good literacy skills and sound mental health. Fano Afina Plunkett is a charity and Aotearoa's largest support service for the health and well-being of tamariki under five and their Fano. It offers free pl Plunkett nurse visits and a free 24-hour Plunkett line, along with parent groups, education courses, playgroups, and more. Today, you'll hear from three top health researchers about the latest in infant sleep, what normal sleep is, how think ba helping babies to fall asleep, and keeping them asleep. Uh, as a new time dad, I, I definitely am looking forward to this uh, research. They will also discuss the relationship between infant sleep and the maternal mental health. Uh, and look at infant sleep through the lens of Māori and Pacific whānau. So our three speakers are Professor Harriet Hiscock, who is a consultant, paediatrician and National Health and Medical Research Council Practitioner Fellow. She is Associate Director, Research at the Centre for Community Child Health and Director of the Royal Children's Hospital Health Services Research Unit. Uh, she has led innovative research in the area of sleep in babies, in particular and relevant to this webinar, in parenting to prevent sleep problems in infants, which also looked at outcomes for parents of such interventions. She would be one of the leading experts in this field in Australasia. Next up, Associate Professor uh, Rose Richards is the De Deputy Director of Va'a o Tautai, Division of Health Sciences. She is from the villages of Vaimoso in Samoa, Christchurch and Ōtautahi, Te Waipaunami. She is a, has a background in behavioural psychology and public health and is currently Principal Investigator on an HR Sea Pacific project about sleep health among Pacific families. She leads the Pacific stream of a better start's Moi Moia sleep project. And last but not least, Dr. Justine Kemp no kaitahu kāti mamoi waitaha, who is a research fellow at the University of Otago. She leads the Māori stream on the Moi Moia, which aims to develop a sleep toolkit tailored to Māori and Pacific whānau. Moi Moia's intervention will focus on supporting communication and connectedness between children and caregivers using cultural narratives as a key delivery method. It will also test whether improved sleep has a spillover effect on healthy body weight in children. And so before we get started on our webinar, just a bit of housekeeping. Today's webinar is scheduled for one hour, including Q&A. All audience members will be automatically muted throughout the session. A recording of today's webinar will be made available to all attendees as well. And there will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar today. Please submit any questions you have using the Q&A function, which is different to the chat function. Uh, that Q&A function is located at the bottom of the Zoom window. Our chairs for today are Professor Barry Taylor, the Dep Deputy Director of A Better Start National, National Science Challenge, and Whānau Afina Plunkett's Chief Nurse, Dr. Jane O'Malley. Uh, welcome to you both, and I'm going to hand the Rako Kōrero over to you, Barry. Kia ora. Okay, um, kia ora everybody. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, it's my pleasure to um, open this uh, meeting uh, about 20%, between 20 and 30% of uh, young children are described by their parents as having a sleep problem. So we're going to talk about something that actually is pretty common. Uh, I've been interested in sleep uh, all my life, uh, one way or another. 
Uh, and um, and I, I, I think I want to introduce Harriet by saying that about uh, 11, 12 years ago, we designed um, uh, a, a study, an intervention study to try and prevent the child with obesity. Uh, and one of our graduates who is currently in Melbourne, Melissa Wake, I said, who's, who's going to help us with this, the sleep side of the study? Uh, and she suggested Harriet. Um, so Harriet came over and during those few days, uh, I realized what a bright spark she was. Uh, and, and her knowledge and her ability to translate into practical help um, was not only in her personal conduct, but also in the trials that she um, was just publishing at that stage. She's gone on to even greater things, uh, so, but her interest in sleep remains. And it really is a great pleasure to, to introduce her uh, and uh, ask her to, to do the first session uh, of this webinar on, on infant sleep, and uh, then we'll go from there. Harriet, welcome to New Zealand. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for the um, the chance to um, speak. And I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional um, owners of the land on which I'm meeting today, which is the Wundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Now, I'm just trying to take control. I don't want to give up remote control. I'm trying to advance it. There we go. It is working. So um, I always like to think about sleep in the context of history, and there's lots of quotes out there, but I think this last quote by Leo Burke, people who say they sleep like a baby usually don't have one, is very fitting. So I just want to give a little bit of background about what controls sleep, because if you understand normal sleep, then you can understand what might go um, wrong with sleep and then how to help families and babies. So um, our sleep-wake cycle is really under two main systems of control. The, the fancily named homeostatic system is really, if you don't get enough sleep, your body increases its drive to go to sleep. So if you have um, up all night and you're partying, um, you feel very tired the next day, but if you have a little nana nap in the afternoon, then you often won't go to sleep until later that night. So that's the homeostatic system. Then there's our circadian rhythm or body clock, which is really influenced by um, things internally, such as our genetic makeup and also melatonin, but also um, things happen in our body prior to waking, for example, our temperature rises and our plasma cortisol levels rise, and the opposite happens um, when we go to sleep. We can't easily control certainly our genes or melatonin unless you're giving um, melatonin um, externally to someone, but we can control the environmental cues of our circadian rhythm. So that's in particular light and dark, and we know that light stops the natural production of um, melatonin in our brains, um, whereas the dark increases melatonin production. And we can also control noise, but you certainly don't want to have a completely quiet environment for babies because that's not uh, realistic or sustainable. Is it going to keep going down? Sorry, it's just freezing. Okay. So this is a graph that I draw for all the families that I see, a very simple schematic of sleep cycles with the baby starting off awake here, going into light or REM sleep, and then into non-REM or deep sleep, coming up into light sleep, back into deep sleep, up into light sleep, back into deep sleep, and cycling like this throughout the night. Why is this important? Well, I think it's to tell parents what is normal about sleep. So in deep sleep, babies will often lie still, but they might do that odd jerk or startle. And that deep sleep, as you saw in the graph um, before, is mostly in the first half of the night. Light sleep, when they come up into that REM sleep or dreaming stage, it's called REM sleep because of the rapid eye movement under their eyelids. And parents who often co-sleep with their babies will say babies are really restless sleepers. But that's because babies have more time in REM sleep than we do as adults. And babies can grizzle and groan and they can do 360s in their cot. And this particularly happens more in the second half of the night. Those sleep cycles in babies last anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes. And they last longer in us around 90 minutes. And babies naturally rouse um, from their sleep cycles a lot during the night. They have their most consolidated sleep in the first few hours of the night, and that's when um, I tell parents to go to sleep soon after their baby does if they're having issues with sleep. Because if you uh, let your baby have two or three hours of sleep and then you go to bed around here, 
You just get into your deep sleep when your baby wakes and then you feel like you're waking from the dead when that happens. Getting to sleep is um, a learnt skill for all of us. And we talk about sleep associations. So, you know, however we um, go to sleep here at the start of the night is the way that we expect to go back to sleep when we naturally rouse overnight. So if, for example, um, you rock a baby to sleep at the start of the night, when they wake up a few hours later, they will expect to be rocked back to sleep usually. And this can continue throughout the night. So these are known as sleep associations or sleep cues in the literature. A little bit about what is normal and um, some of the great work comes from Jackie Henderson's work in New Zealand as well about what is um, normal or usual sleep patterns. And we all know when babies first come home or in their first few weeks of life, they'll hopefully just sleep feed, sleep feed. And they start to consolidate their sleep into the nighttime from around three weeks of age. And Jackie Henderson in her PhD had um, infrared video cameras on cots for babies, uh, I think it was around 96 um, healthy New Zealand babies. And she actually um, documented that babies could sleep um, for eight hour blocks where they were waking up but resettling themselves without calling out, with, without crying to their parents. And that happened from a median age of three months, so really quite early. In terms of sort of looking at what that look, sorry, looks like, um, this is a, an actig, um, actigraphy recording of a baby. This is weeks out after birth, so three weeks of age right up to 26 weeks of age. And this is um, their activity from midnight um, through to midday. And when it's dark, they're lying still, so that we presume they're asleep. And where it's white, they're awake. You can really see in those first few weeks of life, there is no pattern whatsoever. But for this baby, probably around 14 to 16 weeks of age, they're starting to consolidate their nighttime sleep. I get asked a lot about how much sleep is normal. And I don't like answering this question because I don't think we should have a prescribed amount of sleep that a baby should have. This is data from the Longitudinal Study of Australian Children, so over um, around 8,000 children. And this is um, from birth through to nine years of age. And this is the percentile um, of sleep. So this is, you know, in the first year of life, some babies were reported by their parents to be sleeping for 10 hours and some were sleeping for 18 hours. So there's huge variability. And I always say if a baby is awake and happy, they're probably getting enough sleep. If they're awake and grumpy, they may not be. So moving um, on from normal sleep and, and understanding the physiology of sleep into the type of sleep problems we see um, as practitioners. And really it's, you know, difficulties going to sleep, difficulties um, staying asleep, and also a group of babies who catnap and just have one sleep cycle a day. So as Barry was saying, these sleep problems are really common. Um, 30 to 45% of Australian parents will report issues with their baby's sleep. And they double to triple the risk of postnatal depression in mothers. And they're associated with poor maternal physical functioning. But they also affect the mental health of fathers. What do we do? And this is my sort of overall approach that I'll walk through today. Um, the first thing is to make sure you have good sleep habits or hygiene and in inverted commas. And in babies, that means a similar bedtime each night. It doesn't have to be the same time exactly. A similar bedtime routine so the baby knows what to expect and that's consistent. Um, a media-free bedroom, which is hopefully not such a problem with babies, but certainly is in toddlers and older children. And for babies where I see um, where they're feeding frequently overnight and they might be over six months of age and the parents are exhausted, to start to separate feeding and sleeping in the baby's mind, I recommend giving the last feed outside the bedroom um, in a quiet place and then taking the baby into their bedroom to settle after that. Uh, I also work on teaching parents to recognise when the baby is tired and to try and settle them the same way each night, so being consistent. So the tired signs that we often see in babies are the, you know, the clenched fists, the jerking movements, the frowning, the grizzling, and crying is often a late sign. And sometimes if babies have got really upset, it, you know, you can't settle them, you need to cuddle them and, and calm them down. Parents may misread these signs as boredom or hunger and so try and stimulate their baby more, which is often not useful. And um, so as a rough guide, I talk to parents that your baby may start to be tired 
um, after an hour and a half at five to six weeks of age, and it might be after two hours um, at 12 weeks of age, and that includes um, feeding. We encourage um, parents to put their tired baby into the cot drowsy but still awake. And for babies under six months, they may pat or stroke their baby until they're quiet but not asleep. And then parents may leave the room and come back at two-minute intervals. And I, I suggest two minutes or less in this younger age group. Consider wrapping your baby um, and consider the use of the dummy. If the babies, and this is, you know, associates are always going to sleep with a person or an object, if that person or object is there, they can get to sleep easily. But if they're not there, it's hard for them to get to sleep. But I only help parents with sleep issues if the parents think it's a sleep problem. If they're happy getting up three or four times a night and feeding or rocking their baby or cuddling them, that's fine. So I've got one minute. Um, so the main strategies we look at are establishing parent goals, explaining sleep and sleep cycles, and then really offering these three um, options here. So camping out is when you put a camp bed or a chair next to the baby and you might pat them off to sleep for the first few nights and then you start to move yourself away from your baby's bed. It takes one to three weeks to work and are particularly helpful if babies are anxious um, rather than angry if their parents leave the room. The checking method is when you come and go, um, so you settle the baby in the cot, you leave the room, if they're grizzling, you ignore, if you're crying, you come back in and resettle your baby in the cot. And you gradually, for babies over six months of age, stretch those time intervals. And the third option um, I'll talk about later if we have time in the Q&A is parental presence. There's no evidence as to the best time intervals for the um, checking method. You certainly don't do it if a baby is sick. Lots of people ask me about does it cause harm and I'm happy to talk about it more in the Q&A but follow up from our trials has shown no evidence of harm at one, two and six years of age after having gone through these, these sorts of methods. Um, I won't look at parental presence, I'm happy to talk about managing phasing out of night feeds um, if we get to that in the Q&A. So I, further management, just to wind up, um, is I always encourage um, the mums, because it's usually the mums who come and see me, to talk with their partner about their plans and make sure the partner's on the same page, to use a sleep diary to track progress, because when you're sleep deprived, you can't remember what's happened often one night to the next, and always follow up, so we'll review one to two weeks later. I won't go into catnappers, and I know you know about co-sleeping. We write down um, management so parents can recall what you see, um, you've said when they leave the room. And we do use something like this with a sleep diary to track that progress. I'll just end on the extinction burst because I think this is not well talked about often in practice, but 20 to 30% of babies or older children when you're doing a sleep um, intervention, things can go really well, but two to three weeks down the track, you get a burst of the behavior that you um, successfully extinguish. And provided the baby is well and they're not sick, you can advise the parents to go back to their settling strategies. And then usually after two to three nights of that, they'll settle back into their good habits again. Okay, so I think I'll end on that. And um, there's just some resources there. And I think we're sharing these slides of um, podcasts and sleep training resources that um, we've got available in Australia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harriet. Um, uh, the, some of the basic physiology and um, uh, some important messages uh, uh, about training to learn to go to sleep for babies. The, um, in New Zealand, we've obviously got um, a, a, a strong, uh, I guess, Maori view of things and also a, a large Pacific population. And so in our Better Start Challenge, we've been doing a lot of work to look at uh, the different viewpoints about sleep that come from different cultural groups. So it is my pleasure to uh, introduce um, Rosalina Richards. Uh, she is here in Dunedin where I am and she has uh, taken on uh, the study of actually talking to Pacific families uh, and coming up with, a, um, I guess, the view from the Pacific viewpoint of infant sleep and I'm looking forward to hearing what she's got to say. Over to you, Rose. 
Uh, thank you, Barry. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um Palava, Malolele, Bulvanaka, Kiorana, uh, and Māori. Uh, particularly uh, happy Kiribati Language Week to everybody. Um, I guess just to lead on. Uh, You've muted. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute myself and control the screen at the same time. Um, so we're going to talk about um, mostly about Moi Moya today um, and use that as a platform to talk about Pacific perspectives, um, about sleep and also Māori perspectives on sleep because it's been a very big part of our journey. Um, I want to acknowledge Rachel Taylor, who I think is out there in webinar land, um, as, as one of our leadership team on this space is we try and weave together um, how would we create an intervention that really foregrounds um, particularly Te Ao Māori um, and weaving Pacific perspectives in that as well. So I'm going to do this, we're going to do this in a couple of ways. So first of all, I'm going to talk about um, Pacific concepts of sleep um, because we've found we've needed to go back to first principles on things. Um, and then Justine's going to take it a little more into the um, the concrete creation of uh, tools for, for sleep, which is the next step that you know, has come after this, this early um, conceptualization. There we go. Um, so just, I guess the, the, our very first step into this already takes us into a slightly different space. So um, the things that we'll be sharing, um, we're not sleep experts. I don't think Justine would say that she's a sleep expert either, um, but we are kaitiaki, we are overseers, we are uh, navigators, negotiators about information that our communities have shared with us. Um, and it sits differently to Western knowledge, uh, which is often um, you put it out there and it's, it's free for all. Um, because sleep is when you are at your most vulnerable um, as a community, um, it, it, there's spiritual um, challenges and risks around sleep time. Different peoples have created important ritual, important traditions about how to stay safe, how to keep your collective safe um, during that very vulnerable time. So some things in this space will be being shared. Other things actually will just sit with particular families, particular iwi, uh, with particular Pacific communities. So we're kind of co-creating things that we think um, could be taken more broadly by um, our colleagues, our well, well child providers. Uh, but for us, there's a, there's a bit of a balance there about what is to be shared and, and uh, also what is not. So I think as Harriet um, described very succinctly, well done. Um, there, there's a lot of information in, uh, around and in the New Zealand context as well about um, sleep and some key messages that have come through um, that we kind of started at the but uh, question was, how is this um, uh, being tested in other communities, particularly indigenous, indigenous communities, migrant communities? Um, and our colleague Lou Whangapur has done a, a systematic review of uh, sleep RCTs and under fives. And there really wasn't much there at all that had focused on um, indigenous perspectives. Um, so we're wanting to foreground that. Um, but also the, the work that we've done prior to Moi Moya um, and our own kind of family anecdotes was that that there was some disconnect between um, the lived realities of, of some of our community and some of where some of those messages um, were hitting. And where that becomes an issue is um, where messages that we share are irrelevant. Um, so they're just quickly thrown off the side of the parenting boat, um, but also where they can be um, diminishing uh, for a family or a community. Um, and, and so, the care around some of the language that we use. And, and I think we've had some discussions about hygiene as one of the words that's commonly used um, in this space and, and as, as Harriet, I think it's sort of habits, hygiene. Um, so the issue with hygiene is if, if you're not fulfilling these rules, therefore, are you unhygienic? And, and that, you know, if you say that to someone that carries a lot um, uh, of, of weight um, and, and shame and, and also some of the narrative around um, being dirty, being unhygienic has been weaponized in the past against um, indigenous and, and um, migrant communities and, and used to uh, lessen our status as, as citizens of a country. So pulling back a little bit from that and thinking about, okay, 
um, where might we, might we create some um, interesting resources that are really based on um, some of the, the perspectives that we might have um, as, as, as worldviews that sit a little differently. Uh, what often haps, happens in our spaces is there's a hot new area of something really exciting. Um, interventions get developed. They're developed for more mainstream communities. Um, five or 10 years later, we realize they're not working for Māori and Pacific. Then we start trying to bolt on something to that intervention. Uh, and so we're not doing our job in the equity space where we risk creating further inequities. Um, so in this space, we really wanted to um, be on the front of that wave, to be the first out of the gate uh, when it came to creating interesting interventions that um, might work uh, for our families. Um, so I guess in this space, we've been thinking about this as a gift. Uh, what can we gift to our families? What is uplifting across things that are important to us? Um, and what recognizes the strengths that our communities already have? Um, rather than saying you're doing this wrong and this wrong, what about the stuff that, that people are already doing really, really well? And um, I remember from my days as a young parent, I really needed to hear that I was doing well as well. Um, so from my perspective, and in terms of um, the Pacifica space, what I thought I'd do is, is just talk a little bit about sleep in the context of a holistic health model. Um, so this is a Fono Fale model. Um, this is um, created by Fui Moano Carl Poloto Enderman. Um, and it's probably one of the closest things we've got to a pan-Pacific model, because all our Pacific cultures have different um, conceptions of health as well. Um, and so in, in the New Zealand context, we use it quite a lot to talk about, okay, this is how some of the factors that might be important in a Pacific family's life. And this, this is health, this whole deal. And so um, it's holistic, um, it's dynamic, and families are trading off one for the other. Um, there might be times when you're putting a bunch of energy into family, um, but then, you know, you maybe compromise on your physical health a bit, um, your mental health. Um, we are constantly trying to manage the time and energy that we have. Um, and what's interesting in this in the sleep space is it actually has a lot to do with lots of these spaces. And so that's one of the exciting things about sleep is um, we can do a lot to actually uplift many parts of, of this whale, of this idea of health. Um, so a lot of the time in, health, in, in the health sector, we, we focus a lot on that, that PO, that pillar, which is physical. Um, and we're pretty good at measuring physical health and describing physical health. Um, sorry, I just threw a pen at my children. Um, <laughs> balancing. Um, and so I won't talk too much about that, but obviously some of the physical things that we're really interested in around Pacific is, is the links between um, sleep and obesity, sleep and physical well-being. We are very ambitious in that space to make change. Um, but to, to touch on a few of those things that, that perhaps are less in the conversation, um, if you see the bottom of that model, family is the foundation. If everything is built off family. Um, so that immediately takes us into the space of rather than sleep interventions for an individual child, what's happening for the whole family? How is the whole family sleep dynamic um, occurring? Because um, that is where, as a whole family, you, you need to be supporting each other and, and um, finding ways for everyone um, to be getting enough sleep. Um, what do we want to support in our families? Well, one of the things that we are really interested in is obviously family harmony, uh, family connection. Um, and so when we think about things like um, the rituals that we have to build family connection, uh, family lotu or prayer in the evening, um, being a decompressing time, a transition into a restful time, um, meal times being part of that connection building, offloading at the table, and then being able to move through this transition from the, the day uh, into your home and then um, moving into a space where you feel safe and well um, enough to sleep as a family. Um, what is interesting in, in, um, in that space is that it's not necessarily quiet. Um, so when we think about a peaceful home, um, the laughter, the, the banter, the um, games, all of that can be part of a, a de-escalation, but it's not necessarily quiet de-escalation, particularly in a, in a, a home with um, lots of people, but it's still building connection. Um, so it's a really important part of, of um, this model. 
Um, culture is the roof, the thing that protects all things. So again, you get a sense of, well, this is one of the ones that is really important to be investing in, um, in our interventions. Um, one of the things that is exciting about being part of Better Start is that it's not just one outcome of, of something like healthy weight. We also get to talk about things like literacy and language. And so we would love for language to be built into our interventions where we can support um, uh, language and transmission of cultural um, ideas and values into that night routine. Um, and so that's a really exciting part of what we think about in our uh, in our interventions. Also mental health, mental well-being, um, cultural identity is, is linked to um, well-being. So both for family members and, and the child, if you're able to be expressing your cultural identity, um, soothing, um, connecting with your cultural space at the same time as, as your evening rituals or routines or traditions, then that's good for uh, mental health and well-being uh, within the whole within the whole family limit, uh, uh, family unit. Um, time is important. Um, one of the things that we hear from our families, particularly those who have come from the islands, it's a very conscious um, curriculum, a conscious learning and adaptation from what time is in the islands to time in the New Zealand context. So um, having to be at school at a certain time, having to be at jobs at a certain time, working um, shift work, which many of our families do, um, really shifts around um, ideas of, of what you have to do when um, and things like children's bedtimes, which perhaps weren't necessarily necessary um, when you didn't have those time constraints, actually now becoming something that, okay, this is, I think this is something we're going to have to be doing um, now to get the kids to school um, at a certain time. Environment is, is really important as well. Um, so uh, our, our physical climate that we have in our homes, um, one of the, the questions we had around um, some of the recommendations about having, uh, make the assumption that you have your own sleep space, um, that you might have your own room. Um, that's, that's not necessarily true in our larger families. You are sharing a sleep space. Um, and also for many of our families, you don't have your own dedicated sleep space necessarily. Um, you might be, thank you, um, you might have um, other people come and stay certain times of the year, come over from the islands, might stay for a month, you're out of your room. Um, for some families it was, who am I going to sleep with tonight? Am I going to sleep with Nana? Am I going to sleep with uh, my brothers? Am I going to, so, so not necessarily having a dedicated sleep space that was your own, but that being seen actually as a, a really positive part of, of uplifting family. Um, and I guess spirituality would be the final thing to mention, um, the importance of, of um, prayer and connection with um, God or traditional um, ancestors as part of your well-being, looking after yourself. And, and co-sleeping kind of came into that uh, um, a, a bit as well, that different ideas of what safety means. Um, and so sharing um, the idea that we would never let our elders sleep alone in a house somewhere that wouldn't be safe for them, sending the kids to go and sleep over with them. So, so different ideas about how you keep yourself safe at night um, in all the different realms of, of your well-being. Um, so just to, to signal what's happening next in our space for our Pacific colleagues, um, we, are, we are working with Moana Research to break this down into more specifically, because um, Samoans will have a different idea about this, Tongans will have a different idea about this, Fijians will have a different idea about this. So we need to make ethnic specific um, kind of resources because each have their own ways of moving um, in this space. So I will move us along to um, a pass over to Justine in a second. Um, to acknowledge in Moi Moia, we have a lot of different partners. This is not, this is knowledge that spans our nation and, and our Pacific region as well. We have a lot of partners helping us, particularly acknowledging our well child um, provider partners and Plunkett um, has a, a really large role in that, as well as um, um, some Māori health providers. Um, this, is, this is a big enterprise to bring, bring all these ideas together and test them. Um, so we are going to be testing um, some of these ideas that, that Justine's going to unpack for us. We have had to move to an online um, space. Um, uh, but we're going to try and do our best within that environment. Um, and this is sort of the, the big picture of, of what it is we're up to, thinking about settling, um, setting and support. Um, and Justine's going to break down for us those components of, of where she's got to uh, in terms of 
of what tools might be uh, useful in that space. Um, Justine, is it okay for me to hand over to you now? Justine is in Karatane, which is in a rural area. So shout out to our, our rural whanau who have interesting internet experiences. So if she does, if she does click out, I will try and cover if I can. Uh, over to you, Justine. Thanks, Rose. Um, so I think Rose has essentially covered a lot of the context. Um, when we initially started, we wanted to look at the, the tools that or the tikanga, as we call them, that we use to transition. Um, and our biggest transitions often within the Māori world um, are transitions between tapu and noa, or restricted and unrestricted. Um, and so the tools that we typically use for those are water, which is why, um, kai, so me, um, food, and um, pūdāko we ended up extending it to, but traditionally it would be karakia. Moving on. Uh, the, so previous research that I'd certainly undertaken were these were tools that Fano used to manage our well-being, um, and so we wanted to be able to gift those um, to Fano and sort of a show them what they already do works particularly well to manage our well-being, but also for those people that don't have the connection um, to the Māori world due to colonisation, then being able to gift back those tools so that um, we set them up. Um, we have a, a notion of wairua, which um, I guess spirituality is one way of um, understanding wairua, but it is the, the one component of our, our being as Māori that can, can span the mental health, the learning, the healthy weight, and um, is something that um, sleep um, is designed basically to improve our wairua during the evening. So we wanted to sort of focus on that, that one notion of wairua within these tools. Next. Um, so the first, we've called them PO. So although it's technically an intervention, um, we wanted to be really, really clear with our whānau that our Māori worldview and our Māori way of parenting is not a problem that needs fixed. Um, we want to be a lot more strength-based and say actually some of our beliefs and our ideas and our practices that have been passed down from generation to generation work well for us. They serve us well. So we're not necessarily trying to intervene. We're just trying to um, improve and uplift where we can. So we started in the first um, part of our sleep toolkit is this idea of Uru time. So um, Uru is short for a, a deity that we have in the Māori culture, Uru Tinganana, um, and there's also um, other Uru Atua. So we wanted to kind of look at that, that, that level of our cultural knowledge in order to be able to frame the tools that we're doing. Um, so we asked, um, very similarly to our Pacific team, um, we actually looked at what whānau do when they sleep um, and how their households look and what they understand around sleep. So just really quickly, at some point, all whānau co-sleep. So 100% of the whānau that we interacted definitely talked about co-sleeping. And COVID was one time in which they did that. So I've got whānau reported sleeping marae styles. Essentially, um, during times of stress or um, times of change, Fano will actually all bring their mattresses together and sleep in the same space. So marae styles, is, it's, that's how we sleep at the marae. Everybody has one room and everybody sleeps in the same space. Uh, typically with Bardi, we don't leave our kids to cry or put them in a dark, quiet room. Um, that was the findings that we had. Um, however, two of the Fano, which I guess isn't think, um, a lot, did because they were advised by their, their mainstream health providers that that was the best um, way for them to put their kids to sleep. Uh, all of our whānau had at least two generations evolved. Obviously most will because you've got at least a parent and a child, but we certainly uh, have a lot more intergenerational whānau. So for example, in my household at the moment, we have four generations and that is quite common um, amongst our whānau. So we knew that everybody in the household had at some point a role in settling a baby to sleep. All whānau absolutely reported that they used some form of water, so water-based care, kai, um, pūdāka, which are our cultural narratives, all forms of cultural narratives, um, cuddles, snuggles and rocking. 
So our first component that we want to look at was called dungle time. So essentially, we actually realised that a lot of whanau start the bed preparation around dinner time. Um, and if you've got, for example, toddlers in the house or other things that are going on at that time, it can be um, deemed a little bit hectic. Um, but for some of us, it's just a good time. So that's when um, we want to concentrate on some ideas that can help settle the mum and the whanau before they actually go and um, work on the, the settling routine with the pepe. Uh, we have an atua named Rungo, um, and he actually has different personas. So he is, I guess, mostly known as the god of peace, and we, and we thought that was a good concept um, to wrap around this toolkit. One of his personas is Rungo Maraido, so um, what we want to aim from that is getting some sort of activity happening, often physical activity. And if you think about, if you stand on the beach and look out at the ocean, it's a great expanse. And this, that sense of inner peace that you get from interacting with that space, um, we think is a useful tool that can create a bit more harmony within the whanau. Rungo Matani is the atua of um, uncultivated food. So one of the good things about going so so far back within a Māori context is that we can kind of recreate that context for today. So that's where we can start looking at um, healthy kai and the, the food aspect that um, will go with food. Um, and Ōrungo Nui is one of our 29 and a half <laughs> um, lunar calendar days. So the good thing about um, looking at the lunar cycle is that we can understand um, how sleep can be quite cyclical over time. So we know that during sleep, certain lunar phases, um, mental health indicators drop. So 35% of our young people commit suicide during a new moon and 15% during a full moon. So we know that during some of those cycles, um, we can have some impact onto the, onto the well-being. As you know, during a full moon, the, um, the sky is particularly light. So um, Rose is one of our PhD students that she found in Samoa that back in the day the entire village of children were taken to the middle of the village or the middle of town during a full moon and they were able to run around and burn off their energy until whatever time that they started looking tired and then they were taken home to settle. So we believe that we've got some good natural world um, resources that can actually help um, with the cycles of sleep. So that's long time. Hopefully it makes sense. Um, and then whānau assets, we're calling them. So we understand that we, we're we all on a spectrum. So as I said, I live intergenerationally and I have my mother um, for support. And when I was a young mother at 20, I had my grandmother and a great-grandmother alive. And that is um, quite often how it works for whānau. We understand that there are some that don't necessarily have that support in the same way. Thanks, Barry. Um, and so we um, want to be able to kind of look at what resources and how we can support that, whether it's advice and asking, you know, suggesting they ring Plunkett line, um, getting a nanny service in, uh, getting them to interact with the GP or whatever that um, they need in order to be able to um, get that support. So I didn't really explain Udu time. Anyway. Um, how will we measure success? Uh, we think that the current mainstream non-culturally specific measures of outcomes are not suitable for this process um, or for this project. So as you could imagine, um, there is only a chaos theory questionnaire that currently exists and that doesn't match with the, the underpinning knowledge that we're getting from Dongo time. So we um, have been currently reworking um, how we can measure um, our success within our um, project. What we really want to let Vano know is that being Māori is not a problem when it comes to sleep, just because the way we settle using ritual um, is different from what is supposed sleep hygiene. So um, that's a really significant focus of what we're up to. And that's I think kind of us in a in a thing I, I think it's quite different from book bath bed um, and we totally oh, I'm sorry we've got visitors <laughs> um, we yeah so we um, yeah we're really looking forward to be able to um, normalize how Māori settle babies um, in our Pacific whānau as well and also gift some of the resources that we can potentially have for mainstream
I'll just mute because my people are noisy. Thank you. Um, Jane, do you want me to carry on or? Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Barry. I just need to explain everybody that I'm losing my voice. Um, but I also want to, I mean, I just really appreciated the contribution of the panelists. Um, uh, just such riches and, you know, being a grandmother, watching my children now go through, go through the, the ritual and the sleep settling um such richness in the conversation so thank you but i'm going to hand over to barry to chair the session because i can't do it right now okay um welcome everybody to the question and answers now uh, there's been a, a conversation going on question and answer part of the webinar that i'm sure some people are following i, I just like to comment um clearly when you're a health practitioner seeing a family, um, you need, you'll have some knowledge. And I think the knowledge of sleep cycles and what Harriet talked about is really helpful in, in, in having a background about what is happening at, in, in terms of the baby's physiology, because the physiology will be much the same no matter what your ethnicity. But I think what's been illustrated to me so far is the importance of context. Uh, and actually understanding that, um, that you've got to interpret the physiology in the context of the family that you're actually talking with. Uh, because what will work for one family won't work for another. And in fact, if you, if you don't understand the context and the cultural context in particular, you may end up doing more harm than good. So I think that this is what we're trying to learn, I think, in New Zealand now, is how do we actually what, what are the tools that would be helpful for infant sleep and for the whole family sleep, knowing that a good sleep is actually good for babies and good for parents, um, but how you actually give that advice and the type of advice might differ between families depending on their co the culture. So I think I would just uh, perhaps go first to Harriet uh, because uh, the, the cultural context is much stronger, I suspect, here in New Zealand than it is in Australia. So can I just have your reactions to start with in terms of just thinking about cultural context? Oh, Barry, I, I think I couldn't agree more with what you'd said. And um, while our proportion of Indigenous families in the Australian population is much smaller than the Maori and Pacific Islander you know, populations in New Zealand, uh, we have a lot of different cultures and I remember when I did my first lot of um, sleep trials, the Chinese um, families would bring their grandmother out from China and she would co-sleep with the baby for the first year of life and then she'd go back to China and then the baby would wake five times a night and that's when I'd see those babies. Um, and then I remember having a French mother who said, oh, my baby sleeps through from six weeks. I said, oh, what? my goodness, how? She said, I, I, we closed the door. So, you know, every culture is different. And, um, I, you know, I was quite aghast at that. But I think we've, it, it's, yeah, I think it does play out every context, every culture. And, and I certainly, when families come and see me, I always say, well, what, what are your goals? What do you want to do? And let's work together because there's no one right answer for any of this. Um, thank you. I, I think that we sort of agree with each other. I might uh, go to Rose and Justine. Um, the concept that I find really attractive and I think is really important and not been um, really developed well in the research from my point of view is the idea of peacefulness uh, and having a, a peace at the time that, that you're trying to put babies to sleep when in fact in many families this is not a peaceful time, it's actually a tense time. Um, so I just wonder have we got any practical things yet from Rose and Justine ar around achieving the, the peaceful state when in fact it's easier for the baby to go to sleep because the child's not worried about anything. Uh, yeah, so that's why we use the different personas um, of Rungu. So one of the things is we, this is a most intervention, so we had to break the whole thing into separate components that could be measured. Um, so we've been writing, um, I guess you call them jingles. So because we want to look at the food aspect, it could be that we, we've written some wee jingles um, that you can use when you're planting 
food, for example, um, when you're harvesting, some little mini wire that you can sing to your plants as you're trying to grow them. Um, we've been writing tartai, so they're like um, not quite the same as karakia. So karakia is like a long meditative chanting prayer. So you would use it at sleep time um, because you, you want to get the babies wider into a state. But during the awake time for the settling, you might do a three or four line um, we call it a tartai, it's like a connector. So you might go to the beach and it's embedding that ritual. So one of the, just even in this session, the first thing that happened was Kawiti did us a karakia and he, um, he opened the session and then we all handed over. So we've actually had quite a lot of ritual in the session so that people know what's going on. Um, so when you might call it routine and sleeping and we're saying actually the ritual is, you know, if you start a chant when you go for a walk to the beach then that child's going to know that's what that is and it, it transitions you from being a bit stressed and so there'll be a jingle that you can sing if you're able to walk to the beach for example um, and so they're sort of the tools that we want to use um, different narratives and forms of things so if you are about to sit down and have a meal although people might not be religious if you do a wee karakia it sort of says what we were doing is ended and we're about to sit down and eat and um, the ritual helps you sort of stop and and take take sense, I guess. Yeah. Um, that, that sounds really good. So uh, different uh, songs, but always uh, short jingles, things like that is what we certainly are living in an era when everybody's on their phone instead of uh, with a TV on as well. Uh, and uh, a start of a meal can be very long and the end of it can be even longer. Um, so that makes sense to me. There is a question, I think, uh, from anonymous uh, to Rose or Justine, I think, about what happens with Uru time. How may families use Y during this time? Oh, yeah, so um, when I, in my PhD research, um, as I said, those three sort of transition tools were the main one. And when I looked at Y, it was just kind of a category. So it, it could be, a, if you're a surfer, then you get um, a good sense of settling from going for a surf, if you take the time to do it. Um, if you're into paddling on a waka, then um, that's that, so the, the interaction with blue space. So it could be water based activities or water related activities. So not all whanau are going to have a bath. Um, you might not even have hot water and running water. So what we wanted to do is that that kind of that well being, that sense of well being you get from interacting with water. So town planners put, um, you know, we have Moana Pool here in Dunedin. And we're used to, in the octagon, have a beautiful water fountain. And certainly back in the day, town planners would put sources of water and build them into cities because it, it improves well-being. So it's a nice wide sort of, if you don't have a bath, um, trying to find some way to use water um, because it, it is a, it's a healer within our worldview, certainly. Hopefully that answers that. Yeah, can I just uh, slightly extend that? There is some data to suggest that um, a bath routine actually is helpful before uh, with, with settling. So that would fit um, uh, quite nicely. Um, something about body temperature, because when you do go to sleep, your body temperature drops uh, quite quickly and then slowly rises uh, over the night. So, uh, and actually going to sleep if you're cold or indeed if you're too hot uh, is, is helpful. So having a bath and getting into a warm thermal environment uh, that's comfortable. Uh, is, so Harriet, uh, any more on the physiology here about uh, the, how you might use water uh, in the settling routine? No, that, yeah, that's, that's what I know about Barry and I, I just, it's striking me when you talk about Justin, when I see older kids and I do visual imagery and relaxation with them and I say, what makes you relax? Tell me about it. And they almost always go to the beach and that's where they want to go to in their heads. So I think there's a really powerful connection there for, for the, the parents as well as for the, the baby. I, I just pick, pick up on that, Harriet, too. I think what you said earlier, Barry, about um, feeling at peace in yourself as a parent because they are sometimes responding to you uh, and, and where you're at. Some of the things that, that um, Justine's talking about are as important for the parent as they are for the child. So. Um, it's, it's not just about their physiology, it's, it's also about uh, what, what value add could we put in there where um, parents get to splash themselves a little bit, where 
um, if they're taking the kids out to the beach, they're also getting those uh, benefits as well. So thinking about that, we would call it the VA, the space in between um, people, between a parent and a child, between a person and the environment, building and, and um, uh, strengthening that so that, that you are in a in more of a state of peace, your relationships are in harmony, um, and then you're able to move into a, a, a restful state. Um, I also think for us as Pacific and New Zealand, um, the ocean is our great connector. Um, if you look at that, it's, it's, it's touching our islands. It doesn't separate us. It is the thing that joins us. And so um, for me, I think a lot of the learnings in this space have not been, not quite about the tools necessarily, but it's all of the framing of how we think about sleep and how we think about rest and culturally in a, in a, a Western and New Zealand environment, we don't value our sleep very well. We don't value our rest. We, we are often as a society um, uh, compromising our sleep in a lot of different ways and then expect our children to uh, have these wonderful convenient habits for us. So I think there's a bigger question about what does sleep mean for our families and for our communities and um, if we did have enough sleep, what would that mean for our society as a whole? So, um, yeah, there's a there's a lot of the big picture that I think are, is is important and interesting for us uh, as as service deliverers to be talking about. I think that just uh, reminds me of a couple of things. One is that there is good data to suggest that adult sleep and children's sleep has been getting shorter and shorter over the last fifty plus years. Uh, as lights come on and uh, now technology keeps uh, many of our adolescents up really late at night, we certainly can see the effects on their uh, learning and on their emotional state. Uh, so um, people need to be aware of that. I'm also aware that we did a master's uh, project here, Rachel Sayers, where we asked parents uh, before their baby was born whether they were a, a tense or a relaxed person. And of all the questions we asked that predicted sleep problems, that was the one. So if you, I, I can imagine there would be some tools that would be better for people that are tense or tense-like people versus the very relaxed person. Um, and so what you're developing will not only be what the family context is, but what's the individual context as well, because some people might find some tools more helpful than others. So... I am aware that we've got probably time for one more question. Um, I'm just thinking where we've got to. I think most of the questions have been answered uh, in our system. Um, but so what I'll do is just open it up for any final comments from the panelists, uh, and then uh, we can come to a close with Kapiti. So, uh, Barry, Barry okay. I've, got, I've got a bit of a question um, in that it, I think what we're hearing today is common is is common sense culturally contextual common sense and but health practitioners learn stuff in their training and then they impart that as kind of whatever we want to call it um, and it comes out as a set of rules and then parents take that on because you know the nurse or the doctor or the psychologist or someone told them it so um, I think the gift we can give people is that we should let them, you know, so if we could have some advice that helps people trust themselves, that would be a great gift to everybody. I just, it's just a comment, really. You don't have to answer it. <clears throat> but thank you. I'm finished now. I won't say any more. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jane. We'll just go for a final comment from each of the panellists. Um, so we go in reverse order. Justine, any final comment? You're muted. Is that better? Um, yeah, I actually really like what Jane had said. I think that's why we're trying to um, not call this an intervention, but more of a koha. Uh, at the end of the day, I think our culture has steered us well for thousands of years. And what we really want to prove with this is by drawing upon our cultural context that um, what we're doing is okay, um, intertwined with some, obviously, some science. So we've had a conversation with Barry around, um, you know, if we had to give Fano one message around safe, safe sleep, what would that be? Because we do co-sleep and we're not going to bollock people for doing that, but we need to ensure that Fano get that message. And that was keep the face clear. So 
um, we've been kind of looking at um, some sort of message around WAFT here and, um, you know, keeping that face clear so that we're also promoting some of that as well. So, yeah, kia ora. Kia ora. Uh, Rose? Uh, I guess just to say thank you to, to everyone and, and um, all the people who have who've joined into our conversation. I, I guess I would, I would really love for us to be able to have some honest conversations about sleep. Um, we did a paper earlier on with, with my colleague Lisa Timurenga and Molly George, and we jokingly called it the Everyone Lies to Plunkett um, paper because all of the participants and actually all of the researchers admitted at some point in time that they had told, told some fibs. Um, and I, I think that just shows how how morally fraught sometimes our parenting can be. That we we the, the rules exactly what Jane was talking about. We sort of hear rules and then we worry so much that we're not um, meeting those expectations. And um, I, it would be lovely to have a more compassionate space for us all as parents to um, be able to talk really openly um, about. And this is certainly no critique of our health provider colleagues. It's even amongst our our own parents we we kind of hide away from these things but there's so much that we can learn um, from each other and just just some compassion and some gentleness uh, towards each other and giving that gift um, and that permission to to be yourself uh, as, as Jane was saying as well so thank you everyone it's been really interesting hearing from you all so and I'll go to, uh, finally to Harriet for a final comment yeah, I just think, think I, and I agree with what people are saying. I would also just say, don't forget the dads. Um, we haven't had a chance to talk about the dads today, but <laughs> um, certainly, you know, I see dads who, when you actually ask them, how are you going? They've actually got symptoms of postnatal depression and we haven't supported them and addressed them. So I think if, for our healthcare systems going forward, how do we include dads and in support and sleep for babies? Thank you. I think that is an important point. Um, I would just like to finish uh, acknowledging what Justine said about safety during sleep. Uh, so just to advertise, we uh, this is uh, one of three sessions and our next session will be about safety during sleep. Um, and our panelists there will be Ed Mitchell uh, from Auckland, uh, David Tiffany Leach. Uh, and in fact, I'm gonna, uh, I've done some recent studies uh, around uh, safe sleeps that I'm going to talk about as well. So just to advertise our next session, um, which will go around our networks and I look forward to seeing some of you then. Thank you all the panelists. I think it's been a really interesting session. Uh, and uh, I'll, to finish off, Karakia, I'll go back to... Um, Kia ora Barry, tēnā koe, tēnā tato katoa, it's been amazing and as a dad, I'm just going to say that's awesome to hear some some focus coming to us and you know, I, I bath my baby in a bucket, we don't have a shit bath, so paiana. Um and I just wanted to finish off as a, as a way of closing for us, one of those little jingles, uh e Justine, this is one of the little waiata that I do for my baby um, when she goes to sleep. So I'm uh, Mihiana Kiatato. I hope everyone has an awesome day and we really looking really look forward to hosting another one of these webinars. Kia ora everybody. Yeah. See you soon.